Coming up next on American History TV, author Edward O'Donnell talks about the growing economic inequality of the late 19th century, also known as the Gilded Age. He explores the role of Henry George, a newspaper editor and reformer who took up the fight against the separation of the classes on behalf of the labor movement. The Gotham Center for New York City History hosted this hour and 20 minute event. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you to the Gotham Center. Thank you to all of you uh, coming out tonight. I know some of you are saying Republican debate or Henry George, Republican debate, Henry George, and so I'm, I'm pretty gratified that you, uh, you, you chose Henry George, and hopefully um, you'll be glad uh, that you did. So uh, it's a great thrill to always to come back to New York and to come back to the Gotham Center, a place that I've um, done other talks and people I've worked with. Um, it's a really wonderful event, and it's particularly wonderful because um, I finally get to talk about this Henry George book. So let me just jump right in uh, by showing you a photo, um, getting a little personal here, but that's me when I started this book. And you may, you may be, can see that I don't look quite that young anymore, um, a little bit hairier and all. And the funny thing is, uh, just after I decided to write this book, uh, when I was in graduate school, I, someone had mentioned to me, hey, you know there's a Henry George tree in Central Park. And I said, I did not know that. And about five days later, I'm walking through Central Park, which, remind, remember, it's 840 acres. It's bigger than Monaco. It's a large piece of land. I reached down to tie my shoe. And there, I'm not kidding you, tied my shoe next to the Henry George tree. I thought, that's got to be, I don't really believe in these cosmic signs, but this was a cosmic sign of some sort. I'm on the right track, I better do it. Um, but then, uh, and, and we actually happened to have the camera with us too, which was kind of, kind of funny. Um, I've been working on this so long that one of my daughters, uh, who's now 25, um, <laughs> used to ask me, Daddy, when are you going to finish that, or have you finished your book on Curious George? So... Um, so it, it has been a while, it's been a bit of an odyssey. I will not tell you any of the details except that, you know, life's what happen, happens when you make, uh, you know, firm plans. And so my first book became, is now out as my fourth book. Um, and it's thrilling to have it out. And it's also, in a strange way, it's a better time for it to have come out. I wouldn't have planned it this way, but it's, it's a better time for it to have come out because of the relevance of the topic and Henry George and these very big questions uh, that are dogging our society right now. So, uh, Suzanne mentioned it, and uh, I'll get started with this question about living in a second Gilded Age. I always resist that idea that history re repeats itself. I think that's too simplistic, and I think that Mark Twain had it right when he said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, right? So we're, th this second Gilded Age is not a replay of the first, but it's, it, there's an echo, there's a rhyme, there's a, a reflection of that earlier period. And we can see this in literature. If you just look at some of these titles of these books, uh, the, you know, each, all of which have the, the phrase Second Gilded Age or New Gilded Age in the title or in the subtitle. These have all come out in recent years uh, look, asking this question about, you know, are we in a Second Gilded Age and what does, it, what does it mean? It's a pretty depressing thought to think that we're back in a, in a Second Gilded Age, um, but there, there are reasons, I think, to be, uh, to be optimistic, which we'll talk about um, in just a few moments. So another reason, to, another way that I like to talk about Henry George, this fascinating figure from the 19th century, and, and again to make connections to the present, is in a lot of ways he is the Thomas Piketty of the late 19th century. Piketty came out with this book Capital a couple years ago, Harvard University Press, and boom, they sold 500,000 copies. I mean, I think they would have been pretty psyched if they sold uh, 50,000. And uh, essentially, Thomas Piketty, if you just take this one quotation from the book, you see he's essentially arguing the same point that Henry George did, which is that extreme inequality of wealth uh, can be harmful to growth because it reduces mobility and can lead to political capture by the super rich of our democratic institutions. So there's a lot to worry about when it comes to inequality. Uh, it isn't just that some people have a lot of stuff and other people have less stuff. It actually has very, very large implications uh, for our society. So let's begin. Let's talk about who this guy, uh, Henry George, was. Well, Henry George was born in 1839. Uh, to a middle class, lower middle class family. His father was a book manufacturer, book salesman. And George grew up in a you know, fairly large family, fairly reasonably comfortable. A lot of people think that because he wrote his famous book on poverty that, and, and talked about poverty a lot that he must have grown up in poverty. He actually experienced poverty in, in his middle years, uh, fairly extreme. So Henry G George uh, was not a very good student. Uh, and he left school about the seventh grade. His parents just got fed up with it. And his father steered him into a, into a trade where he would uh, learn the craft of typesetting, which was a very important trade and, and, a, and a great opportunity. So George um, 
flourished as a, as a typesetter, but he was very ambitious, and in the middle 1850s, he headed out to California. You know, so he's a very ambitious guy, guy who hopes to make it big. He's not sure what, but he has this idea that he's, he's destined uh, for something great. And once he gets out to California, he's trying things and failing and living hand to mouth and sleeping in barns and uh, really experiencing poverty full, full on uh, and, and often off and on. He would succeed at something uh, and, then, and then fail. But the good thing is the printing uh, trade always guaranteed him some kind of work and it also got him in the door in journalism. So uh, he went from the typesetting room to doing a little bit of spot writing and editing and eventually became a very successful editor out there in California for a whole bunch of different newspapers. Um, started his own papers and so forth. Um, but his life was very tumultuous. He was, uh, even though he got married, began to have children, he constantly was sort of doing well and kind of riding on top of the world and then crash his newspaper would fail or he would sell his newspaper in order to do something else and then that, you know, that would fall through. So he had a lot of, um, oh here, I forgot to advance the slide. There he is looking at, uh, in, in his younger years um, and age 25 when he's out there uh, on the make in California. Um, the one way I try to, I like to encapsulate or, or bring across this idea of him uh, experiencing this kind of rise and fall, it's sort of emblematic of the b boom and bust economy. He is his own boom and bust economy and he's trying to figure it out. So on Christmas Eve, 1864, he writes in his diary, and he's a very quintessential 19th century man. He believes that if he just works hard enough and tries hard enough and makes good decisions, he's guaranteed to succeed. And so he's always chastising himself for being you know, too rash and making bad decisions. So here he is, almost a New Year's Eve kind of uh, uh, resolution. Determined to cultivate habits of determination, energy, and industry. Feel that I am in a bad situation and must use my utmost effort to keep afloat and go ahead. So he's saying, I just need to work harder. And eventually he's going to come to the conclusion that people like him are not failing just because they're, they lack a little oomph. They're failing because there are larger forces at work. And he ends this entry with, saw a landlady and told her I was not able to pay the rent. Um, something that I think, if anybody's ever been in that position, particularly with uh, two young children, you know that that's not a very good situation to, uh, uh, to be in. So Henry George is shaped a little bit by his own personal uh, background, but he's also shaped by the troubling duality uh, of the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is a great metaphor, right? It's a great term. Mark Twain coins the term. And it suggests that uh, on the one hand, things look golden. Things, it is a golden age. And it is an amazing age of technology, of wealth creation, of innovation, of booming cities and so forth. Things look great. But on the other hand, like a piece of gilded, think about a gilded bracelet, right? If you scratch off the the gold, what, what you're, what's underneath there is a dark piece of, say, iron. It's not particularly uh, exciting or, or uh, uh, enamoring, right? So that's the, the image that the Gilded Ages has this great pizzazz, great glory, you know, golded, golden hue to it, but beneath the surface there's some pretty seriously bad, seriously dangerous things uh, happening. So it's an age of optimism. And you're going to have to trust me that that word says anxiety. I'm not so sure why we, why we lost it there. And George will take that duality uh, and capture it in the famous phrase, progress. It's an age of progress and poverty. And, and this is, a, as he says, is the great problem of the age. But we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Okay. Um, and so let's, just be, let's begin with looking at this idea of progress, how optimistic and, and upbeat people were in the late 19th century about what was going on. Well, here's you know, President Grover Cleveland, and you can find speeches like that. Virtually every presidential address has this kind of talk. Every American citizen must contemplate with the utmost pride and enthusiasm the growth and expansion of our country the wonderful thrift and enterprise of our people, and the demonstrated superiority of our free government, right? So Cleveland is essentially saying free government, free enterprise, everything is great, and we're booming along. Of course, just a few weeks after he gives this address, the Panic of 1893 kicks in and the economy crashes, and, and uh, it's not so good looking. Um, but Cleveland's words really are, are uh, reflective of how people spoke uh, at all kinds of public events and presidential addresses and, and so forth about how great things were in that era. And they're not making it up. Let's just look. I won't bury you in statistics, but just take a look at some of these numbers from the greatest period of American industrialization, this, late, this last third of the 19th century, the Gilded Age. Just look at the right-hand column. You can see the bright red numbers of just e extraordinary exponential growth in, in uh, uh, manufactured goods output. Um, and just take steel, for example. Steel is essentially like a boutique industry in 1860. But uh, by 1900, it's, it's really the great dominant, the great representative industry uh, for that era. Uh, 
and uh, really incredible uh, output. So there, there, there is wealth creation here. The United States is going to go in 1860 for, from the status as a developing country, uh, kind of like Brazil is today, uh, to the world's most dominant economy. That's just in 40 years, so it's a pretty astonishing rise. And there's a lot of celebration to go with this. So in 1866, the Atlantic Cable goes, is laying across the, the Atlantic Ocean connecting Europe and the United States by telegraph. And that is a big national celebration, uh, really in some ways equivalent to, at least in people's minds, uh, of the landing on the moon. Really just this amazing technological breakthrough. It seems so primitive to us, but it was a huge breakthrough uh, at the time. So too was the uh, Transcontinental Railroad when that was completed in 1869. Tremendous celebrations. It's way the heck out in the middle of nowhere in Utah, but it's essentially broadcast, 19th century style, uh, by telegraph all across the country. And they actually have a little telegraph wire attached to the rail, so when Leland Stanford drives the golden spike, it actually connects the, and sends out a signal. And people in, the, in public areas in New York and in Boston, Chicago and everywhere, all erupt in cheers when the, the, the continent is spanned. In the, uh, this is a great era of World's Fairs or expositions, so the Philadelphia Centennial is a huge World's Fair. It draws millions and millions of people from around the country and around the world, and the showcase event at this and all the other World's Fairs, of course, is technology. And there's the Corliss generator there on the right, the most amazing piece of you know, power-generating machinery on the face of the Earth. It, it powered the entire uh, exposition. So it was a big, big... Uh, kind of muscle flexing of, of America's uh, technology and ingenuity. And locally right here, the Brooklyn Bridge, which, you know, today we look at the Brooklyn Bridge and it's this beautiful old bridge. It's got the stone uh, towers and the Gothic archways. And it really kind of takes us, there's a lot of nostalgia uh, associated with the Brooklyn Bridge. But that's not true. When it opened in, in, you know, in 1883, it was the most advanced piece of technology, certainly in the United States and arguably uh, in the world. It was a very complex machine. It was the great example of what steel could do. And so millions of people turned out for this uh, unveiling of the Brooklyn Bridge. The president came, the Congress came, world dignitaries came, and the speeches, as you can imagine, when people gave their speeches talking about this glorious event, they used the word progress, progress, progress over and over again. So there's a lot to celebrate in this uh, time period. Now, of course, there's also people would if you went to the Brooklyn Bridge ceremonies, you wouldn't have to walk very far from the Brooklyn Bridge to find poverty. So there's no question that there's, that there's poverty in this period, but people who are of an optimistic mind, that everything's going great and we don't really need to change anything, um, had various responses to, to, uh, to poverty. One was a fairly traditional one. And uh, here you see my people on the right. There's a, an Irish couple uh, sitting in their shanty, not terribly bothered by, by their po poverty. But Josephine Shaw Lowell was a famous uh, po you know, anti-poverty reformer. Uh, and, uh, but her attitude was very, very traditional. As you can see, she refers to charity is the problem. Poverty is not the problem. Charity is the problem. It's luring uh, what would be hardworking people away from their hard work and br turning them into, as she says, idle and beggar, uh, idle beggars essentially. So she thinks the problem with poverty, uh, with, uh, poverty is that there's too much charity. Americans are too good-hearted, so she creates an organization called the Charity Organization Society, which in truth is actually the Charity Restriction Society, trying to, you know, because she says there's too many soup kitchens, there's way too much free coal giving out, being, being given out, there's way too many free groceries to be had. We need to cut this down so we can help the poor, you know, see the, the, the virtues of hard work. A more harsh view uh, emerged in this period, which is called social Darwinism, and it has a tremendous influence, and it's, it's these concepts of of uh, essentially assigning a scientific and divine plan to poverty uh, have great credence. And you hear these the v words like this coming out of the mouth of, of John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie and many other people. And just read, notice the, the point here. What a blessing to let the unreformed drunkard and his children die, right? No ambiguity there. It's the, the way of the world is for the poor and the drunkard and the, and the glutton and others to die. And thankfully, when they die, they won't therefore have any more babies. And what benevolence to let the lawless perish and the prudent survive. Now, what publication did this come from, right? This comes from the Christian Advocate, the number one selling religious publication in the United States. So this is not fringe talk. This is mainstream talk by, by people who are trying to make sense of things. If you believe this, then you absolutely do not have to worry about poverty. It's going to take care of itself. You, you know, the poor you shall always have with you. That, that kind of thing. 
All right. So on the one hand, there's optimism. There's also, it's also a period of tremendous uh, anxiety. And you don't have to look for it uh, very far. And in fact, some people were both optimistic and anxious at the same time. They, they weren't sure uh, which direction the country was, was heading in. So what are, what are people worried about? Not just Henry George, but many people are worried about what appears to be a rise in, the, in, in poverty. Now just take a look at this image here. When I show this image in, in public, sometimes I don't put any, uh, the, the caption to it. I just say, what do you see here? And more importantly, what book would you associate this with? And invariably, somebody says Dickens. And that's exactly what the artist wanted you to think. And this is a really important thing to think about when you think about the late 19th century, about other periods too. But the late 19th century, if you think, what is, this, what is the core of the American identity? Well, there's several aspects to it, but one of the cores of American identity in the 19th century was we're not European. Now, it has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has to do with politics and, and social arrangements. So throughout American history, we're, we're constantly worried. And in the 20th century, we'll be worried about communism. It's another, that's a, it, it takes its place. But in the 19th century, it's like, are we becoming European? Are we, are we sliding towards a European style uh, of society where you have kings and queens and landed aristocracy, fixed classes, uh, state-supported churches, and, so, and, and endless war and social turmoil? And so this is an image that is really e expressing that kind of anxiety. And notice it's not in the socialist advocate, right? It's in the Harper's Weekly, the na nation's weekly uh, publication, uh, the best-selling one. So it shows you know, a wealthy family and a, and a poor family and raises that question about haves and have-nots and what direction are we heading in. And in fact, this is in the middle of a ter the, the previous terrible depression. I, I already mentioned the, the depression of the 1890s. And uh, just to give you a sense of what, what people are saying, this is a quotation from a very well, uh, probably one of the most important labor leaders in New York City, talking to a congressional committee that traveled the country in 1883 trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, what is this, why this incessant clash between labor and capital? Why all these strikes and so forth? And P.G. McGuire sees the moment and he says to them, you know, look at this city and its long rows of uh, tenement barracks. And he goes on, you can read it yourself, that's saying people are living in squalor. You, it's, he doesn't say it here, but he does elsewhere. European squalor. You know, the kind of squalor we think of when we think of Dickens, when we think of cities like Manchester and Liverpool. We are heading in that direction and we had better do something about it or you know, we're gonna, we're, we will no longer have a, a, a republic that we would recognize. And Walt Whitman, uh, the great voice of, the, of American democracy and, and, and certainly a man mostly completely enthusiastic about America and about the modern world and so forth. In 1879, he gives a, a speech in which he says, think, you know, just concentrate on what he says here. If the United States, like the countries of the old world, there he is, right? He's saying that what, like we don't want to be them, the, the old world countries. Are, if the United States are also to grow vast crops of poor, desperate, dissatisfied, nomadic, miserably waged populations, then our Republican experiment, notwithstanding all its surface successes, and I highlight that because there's that gilded notion, is at heart an unhealthy failure. And this is a, I have many, I could, you know, there's lots of people giving voice to this kind of anxiety about the, the way the country's going, but Whitman gets it in just a couple of words. We seem to be trending European, we seem to be losing our republic. And I love that phrase, by the way, our republican experiment. That was a very, that phrase was with us as a country and as a society and a political culture right up to the end of the 19th century. And then, I don't know, at a certain point when we became a global power, we said, experiment is succeeded and we don't need to worry about it anymore. But it was a phrase that everybody used, this idea that it was fragile, that it was unfolding, that we needed to care for the republic and, and to make adjustments like any good experiment, right? And we've got this idea now that it, it was born in uh, you know, the late 18th century and, and uh, it was good. As soon as the Constitution's ink was dry, we were, we were all set, which of course is, um, not, not really possible when one looks at the historical record. All right, another source of anxiety, uh, the rise of big business. Business bigger than anybody could have conceived of. As Henry George says, the founding fathers, could, you know, they were brilliant people, but they could never have conceived of a, a, a large corporation like, uh, you know, Carnegie Steel or uh, Standard Oil. There's just no way they could, they could imagine that a single individual could have this much power, unelected, undemocratic power, uh, in a democracy. And here's one of my favorite, I have many of these great cartoons from uh, Puck, but this one's called The Bosses of the Senate. And it, now you may be, this is, let's all just take a moment here to think how fortunate we are to live in a society when big business has not any sway at all in Congress. Um, 
way back in the bad old days, um, the trusts, the co big corporations, you can see them sh depicted as money bags, uh, the steel trust, the copper trust, and they are pretty fierce looking people. Notice that they're coming in through the entrance from monopolists, right? There's a big doorway to allow them in. But if you look at the far end, you can see the people's entrance is nailed shut. It says, there's a sign across it saying close, right? So who has access? It's the corporations. Who has no access? Us. Uh, the people. And of course, the size differential is important too to show that the leaders of the republic, these uh, senators, are actually little kids uh, who are kind of, so many of whom are actually cowering in front of the, uh, the, the, the power and the menace of these great corporations. And this again is not in the Knights of Labor Monthly, right? This is a mainstream middle class publication uh, called Puck Magazine that is, uh, expressed, that it is you know, landing on the doorsteps of middle class and upper class Americans. But so this is a kind of a wide. Uh, ranging anxiety about the na nature of the, uh, the problem in the Gilded Age. Here's another one uh, showing uh, the, the sort of unfair duel that, that's taking place. And again, it's another Puck Magazine one. Notice all the symbolism, too. Big business is, is depicted as a, uh, a medieval knight. Uh, again, royalty, Europe, Europe uh, aristocracy, and so forth. And it's a gold knight, right? Gilded Age, gold, golden era. Um, it's also a locomotive, too, so it's a combination of the, 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 the new technology. Um, if you look really closely, the lance that the knight has says subsidized press, meaning they own the newspapers, they own the media. The shield that he has is corruption of the legislature. Uh, and our little scrawny working man, he's, uh, he's got a little hammer in his hand and it says strike, meaning the only weapon he has. That's why we have so many strikes. We'd like to ha avoid them, but the only way that labor gets any attention, can get any relief, is to call a strike, and most of them uh, end up failing. And notice the horse that he's, he's riding on is labeled poverty. And notice also the divide. On the left-hand side, you've got big business tycoons. And, and if you were alive at the time, you'd recognize those faces. That's Vanderbilt. That's Jay Gould, the kind of titans of Wall Street. And then on the right-hand side, you see us, skinny, emaciated peasants, looking like the figures out of, a, out of a Dickens novel. So there's a lot of anxiety here. And it's not just poor working people who are making a dollar a day. It's, it's, it's a widespread anxiety about the direction in which the republic is heading. In rising in, uh, increased inequality. That also becomes an important theme here. Uh, and not just that there's a lot rise in poverty, but there's a ri huge gap between rich and poor. And it seems to be getting worse. Uh, and again, no one's making this up. The data shows that this is absolutely true. The 1%, um, to use a phrase from today, own 51% of all wealth. Uh, and the lower 44%, so less than half the country, owned only 1.2%. So tremendous skewing of, of wealth uh, in the United States. And it raised this kind of question about this, you know, sure, it's a free market and such, but does this, can we, is this a sustainable um, uh, trend? And if you look at where we are today, people always ask, how does this compare to today? In 2010, which is the latest data that I have, uh, the 1% owns about 35% of all wealth, and that is rising rapidly, and it's up from 20% in, in, in 1979. So if, to put it another way, in the century, from the late 19th century to the late 20th century, uh, wealth disparity actually decreased. And think about this, after you know, World War II especially, after the, the New Deal, that interwar, or that post-war period, we were never more equal and we were never more wealthy. It's a very in important thing to, to kind of think about in that 30-year period. All right, another aspect, again, on this European theme, what are the, sure, we have super rich people, we have a growing mass of poor people, but what are the rich doing? People are not imagining the Europeanization of America and the Europeanization of an American elite and the emergence of an American aristocracy because the, they are doing it, they're actually putting on the airs of European arist aristocrats. The woman on the, on the right is, is a you know, wife of a, uh, on the left is a wife of a very uh, powerful businessman. She's dressed up for a costume ball uh, as Marie Antoinette. And there are people that are going to dress up as Louis XIV and many, many other members of European royalty. I mean, to say that this is an unthinkable thing to do just 40 years earlier, uh, just socially unacceptable to mimic European royalty uh, in a kind of an admiring way, uh, tells you that something has shifted in the uh, Gilded Age, that, that the nouveau riche are, going to, are acting differently. There's this ideal of Republican simplicity, which, by the way, if you want to see it in New York, you can see the Fifth Avenue mansions. Now, the woman on the right is Mrs. Vanderbilt. And she, her husband, has built her a stupendous, not a mansion, really, a palace. 
on Fifth Avenue, and there are a whole bunch of palaces like it on Fifth Avenue. But, and that, so that's how the, the, the rich express their wealth, you know, what, what's eventually in this period going to be called conspicuous consumption. But if you go down to, um, down to Gramercy Park, uh, that's where the super rich lived in the 1830s and 1840s. And they, think about how, how those houses are nice, but they're very plain. Most of them, you know, uh, unadorned brownstone facades, maybe a nice little wrought iron fence, but very, very you know, Republican simplicity. No, you don't flaunt it. But 50 years later, you, you flaunt it as, as much as possible. And Mrs. Vanderbilt's ball uh, will cost millions of dollars but in our today's money. It will be covered by the press, and it will touch off a whole competition about who could throw the biggest and most expensive and most outrageous uh, display of conspicuous consumption. Uh, and here's just to let you know, uh, again, if I'd shown you the, the image on the right, just that interior image, Many of you would not have thought of America, you would have thought of Versailles, right? A, a opulent room of, of, uh, furnished with all the, the finest things and, and gold leaf and so forth. But that's Fifth Avenue in New York, and that was the housewarming party that she threw in, uh, in March of 1883. All right, another source of anxiety, rising labor capital conflict. It's, no, it's, it, it's not uh, imagination, it's, it's actually happening on a scale never seen before in American history. Here's the famous uh, Haymarket incident from May 4th, 1886. That's one of the most famous incidents, but there are lots of others. Just take a look at some of these numbers. Between 1881 and 1900, there were 37,000 strikes. In the years, in all of American history, up to 1881, I'll bet you there was no more than 3,000 strikes. I mean, so this is a, just a, a monumental growth in strikes. And some of these are the biggest strikes in American history. Strikes in which 100 people are killed in clashes with police and militia and so forth. Strikes in which the entire national railroad system is shut down. So these are big, big strikes. And they're also small strikes, you know, neighborhood strikes as well. And it's got people saying, you know, what society do we associate with this kind of class clashing violence? It's Europe. And so it seemed to be another source of evidence that we are losing our Republican soul. Why is Labor Day founded here in New York City uh, in 1882? That's, it's founded by workers, P.J. McGuire, the man I quoted earlier, uh, in 1882. Why do they do it? Because they feel that they're slipping, that they're, they are the heart and soul of the Republic, these workers, and their wages are declining, their power in the workplace is declining, the way they, they're... they're position in society seems to be slipping, and so they call, they say, let's have a day, and they pick May, uh, uh, September 5th, 1882, and they stage a parade and a big picnic, about 5,000 people show up. Within five years, it's happening all across the country. Within 10 years, it's a national holiday. That, should, that tells you a lot, this invention of a holiday, that there's something happening in this time period that is, people are calling attention to a social, a, a social problem that needs addressing. All right, uh, so Henry George. Where does he, how does he um, figure into all this? Well, in the 1870s, he's a, a newspaper editor, and he increasingly is identified as a reformist editor. He's taking on questions of land uh, reform, uh, regulating the railroads, big questions out there in, in, uh, in California, uh, the rights of workers and so forth. And he is, like a lot of people, really troubled by this dual quality that so much great stuff is happening with, with industrial capitalism, but also so many problems seem to be associated with it. And why, do, you know, can, is there a way where we can keep the good stuff and get rid of the other stuff? What he terms progress and poverty. Can we keep the progress and not have uh, so much poverty and so much turmoil? And of course, other people were proposing solutions, right? He, there were socialists, big, you know, the birth of the socialist movement in this time period. And George will make a very conscious decision to position himself as not a socialist. He'll say, there are laissez-faire capitalists who say, do nothing, let the poor you know, rot if that's their fate in life, and let us run our businesses the way we want to. That's an extreme that we ought to avoid, says Henry George. And he also says, socialism is also an extreme we need to avoid. Although, it's a little more complicated. He defines socialism in a, in a couple of different ways. When he, he talks about revolutionary socialism, uh, as opposed to sort of gradual socialism. He actually likes gradual so, so, socialism, sort of phased in over 100 years. All right, so Henry George, in his spare time, he's only got a seventh grade education, uh, but he reads like mad, and he reads economics, he reads Ricardo and, and uh, Adam Smith and all the important political economists and determines that they all got it wrong. And he has, is going to sort this thing out and come up with a, a, a diagnosis and a prescription. And here's there are a couple, he's a wonderful writer for a guy with a m marginal education. And this in some ways indicates to us why he becomes so popular. His book 
has parts that are very complicated economic uh, sections, but a lot of it is very, very beautifully written, almost poetic. It's very biblical. It cites the Bible all the time and, and other figures. Great, vivid examples. And here's the, you know, the, essentially the crux of the problem. It is as though an immense wedge were being forced not underneath society, which of course would lift everybody, but through society. Those who are above the point of separation are elevated, the few, uh, but those who are below are crushed down. I mean, he says that's the problem. We have to figure out where this wedge is coming from and how we can redirect it. All right, uh, a couple, I won't bury you. The book is 535 pages, so I, I would take us uh, a couple of days to, to, to read through it. But I'll just give you a couple of other nuggets from it. Everywhere it is evident that this, this tendency to inequality cannot go much further without carrying our civilization into that downward path which is so easy to enter and so hard to abandon. And so George cites history. He says, what happened to Rome? You know, Rome was prosperous and mighty and, and full of science and learning and incredible progress. And then Rome just slid off the, you know, off the cliff. What happened? And he says, you know, what happened was people began to monopolize land and the rich got richer and the poor got poor. And they hit a certain, what we would call today, a tipping point where there's no going back. The society just starts to slide and slides uh, inevitably into the, into the dustbin of history. And he says, we're on that path. And we're, it's not too late yet, but we have to be very, very careful. We can't wait. We have to act immediately. Um, and just think about the, the relevance of, of this, of this uh, quotation to, uh, to our times in some ways. Though knowledge yet increases and invention marches on and cities still expand, civilization has begun to wane when in proportion to population we must build more and more prisons, more and more almshouses, more and more insane asylums. So he says, we've got all this good stuff happening, but yeah, we're building more jails. We're building more poorhouses. This is something is clearly uh, not right. All right, so he diagnoses the problem. Uh, in 535 pages, uh, as saying that what happens is that the wealthy, people in fortunate positions, lucky people, crafty people, are gaining monopolization of not just land, but sort of all key resources. And that's locking out, uh, essentially uh, walling off opportunity uh, for the masses and creating a spiral of destructive inequality. That the rich literally will get richer, the poor will get poorer, and we will lose our Republican soul. And the solution he comes up with, um, which is not as important as his diagnosis, I always make this point, people loved his diagnosis. Very vivid, very powerful, very alarming to, to hear what he had to say about where we were going. They're not so necessarily so enamored, although there are people enamored with it, with his single tax, his, his, uh, his notion that we need to estab establish a single tax on land and that will solve everything. But the point I make before that is that we have to laissez-faire and small government has been great up to this point, but the founding fathers could never have imagined an economy like this. They couldn't imagine you know, a, a national railroad uh, system, a, a, a steel company the size of Carnegie Steel or, or a petroleum company the size of Standard Oil, and that we need to make some small steps towards curbing certain aspects of the economy. And his idea is the single tax. Some people, again, as I say, tried, they like what Henry George has to say in a kind of a general way. They're not necessarily signing on to the single tax, but there's a lot of people who like the idea of the single tax. And one of the, the groups that we'll talk about in just a moment who liked what he had to say were urban workers, right? Most of these are landless people, and they pay huge amounts of money in rent for these, these tenements that they live in. So this, this message has resonance on different levels uh, for different people. All right, so Power, Progress and Poverty, written by a guy with a seventh grade education who self-publishes it to start, right? He can't get anybody to buy it. No, no, Harper's, none of the big publishers will buy it, but he's a printer. And so he says, okay, I'm going to borrow money from friends, I'm going to print an author's edition, self-publish it, and then I'll send it back to those publishers. And it works. He sends a, one to Appleton's, which was a huge publisher in the day, and Appleton says, well, uh, now that you've set the plates, and that'll make it very inexpensive for us, let's do it, and it's going to cause a, a, a stir. And George, grad, he moves to New York City, because he knows, you, if you're a San Francisco editor, the chances of being, having an impact are much, much smaller. Come to New York where things are happening. Also, New York is sort of the, the gateway where American ideas go to Europe, and European ideas come to America, so there's this kind of a chance that this will be a, a global phenomenon. And it works out perfectly. He gets to New York City at just the right moment when things are beginning to happen. Uh, one of those things is the Irish nationalist movement is exploding. And he's not Irish, uh, but he, he 
his message has great resonance with Irish uh, Catholics who are the, one of the largest ethnic groups in America and he finds this is a great way to kind of get noticed and to get speaking gigs and to find his first real audience and also to get uh, he, he becomes well known in Great Britain as a result of that. All right, so why does he appeal to workers? Let's look at this, uh, one of the many questions. Because it's not, when he writes his book, he's thinking, I'm just going to wow everybody. And it turns out his first real core group are American workers. And the real re one of the main reasons is that he challenges that fundamental or that traditional understanding of poverty, the one that we saw Josephine Shaw Lowell uh, kind of touching on. Poverty, said, the traditional interpretation was, it's inevitable. Uh, you really can't do anything about it, and those who are poor just need to endure it, right? Just need to grin and bear it, and their reward in heaven will be, will be great. That's sort of the old-fashioned way of dealing with it, and uh, it, it's, it's easy to say that. It's not very hard, not e easy to hear that when you're the poor person. And here's what uh, one of the workers uh, who became a big Henry George follower and a key figure in his rise to uh, influence and also uh, his, his eventual run for mayor of New York City. Uh, he describes it very succinctly. Progress and poverty reversed all this, meaning reversed all that talk about poverty being inevitable uh, and natural. Teaching that poverty is an artificial condition of man's invention. And I love this last part. Working men and women learning all this commenced to wrestle with their chains, right? And this is why there's so much tumult uh, in the 1880s, especially um, here in New York City. Now, the period 1885, 1886, 1887 is often known by historians, called by historians, the Great Upheaval, because there is a huge spike in strikes, uh, a lot of labor mobilization, and in 86 and 87, a huge campaign of labor parties that form all across the country to, uh, in, in protest to uh, a big crackdown on labor and labor activism. In New York City in 1886, over uh, in the summer of 86, uh, in the wake of strikes and boycotts and in, sort of in the national atmosphere after uh, the Haymarket bombing in Chicago in May of 86, uh, 100 labor activists are arrested. Uh, many of them giving actually very long uh, prison terms. Uh, for cons the, the, there was, it was pretty easy to do that actually because they were accused of and tried and convicted of conspiracy. So if you, if you call the strike or call the boycott against an employer, in the eyes of the law, you were guilty of conspiring with your fellow workers to destroy the business of another person. And so they, you, could be, you could be put away. This is a, one of the big strikes that takes place. The uh, streetcars in New York City, the streetcars which precede the subway system, are privately owned and they're, they're given franchises. They make millions of dollars a year. They, are, they bribe the... I have a great graphic that shows the, the New York City City Council had 24 members um, in 1884. And there's a front page article in the New York Times that shows when a scandal broke out to show that one of the largest streetcar owners bribed uh, nearly every one of them. 22 of the 24 uh, city councilors took a bribe from the huge bribe, $25,000, uh, which in 1884 was a lot of money. Uh, and their status, it says, you know, Tom, Thomas Clancy, uh, third district, fled the country, you know, and, and in jail, in jail, out on bail. That means this incredible list of, of people. And so the anger at the streetcar companies was, they were terrible employers. And there were three big streetcar strikes in the spring of 1886 that really played, that, and a lot of boycotts and a lot of other labor action that um, result in this big crackdown on labor. A lot of workers arrested, a lot of um, unions prosecuted and so forth. And that sort of sets the stage for the labor uh, response. Labor is divided in the Gilded Age. Should we uh, form a labor party like they're doing in Europe uh, or should we try to influence the Democratic Party? You know, use a, use, kind of withhold uh, our support for one candidate or another. It was called the balance of power strategy. And, uh, and one of the reasons why they resisted labor parties is they always failed miserably. You know, there's a, there were labor parties before this, and a labor party candidate for mayor would get like 329 votes. That's it, you know, 500 votes, just a symbolic, uh, so it was a waste of time, a waste of money, deeply embarrassing, and it also divided the labor movement, because people said, this is why we shouldn't do this, let's, let's stop trying to form a labor party. All the crackdown, all the turmoil of, in the summer of 86 leads even the, the most jaded person to say, let's do it. And so the United Labor Party is formed, and they you know, don't just grab any old uh, carpenter or bricklayer to, uh, to run for mayor. They say, we've got to get somebody who's, who's got some credibility. Uh, and Henry George is perfect. 
He has this long record of being an advocate of workers' rights and of, of reform. He's also a card-holding member of the Knights of Labor. He's also a member of the Typographers' Union. So he's got this kind of credibility that um, goes a long way to convincing people to nominate him. And so he's nominated in, in uh, August of 1886 to run for mayor. Uh, the odds are, to say the least, pretty stacked against them. Tammany Hall is a huge, powerful machine, and the Republican Party is, is uh, equally formidable. They've got money, they've got experience, and the workers have none of those things. Here's an optimistic view of things, though. Uh, Henry George, sort of depicted as Hercules, uh, grabbing the great, uh, one of the more common symbols of, of monopoly in the late 19th century, along with an octopus, showing George you know, grabbing the, the serpent. And the serpent is labeled monopoly and trusts and graft and so forth. And George is uh, ideally going to do, do in the serpent. And, and that's City Hall. That's New York City Hall in the background. Well, he, to do that, he has to defeat two people. He has to defeat Abram Hewitt, who's a congressman, uh, with a great uh, deal of uh, credibility. And actually, relatively speaking, he can actually claim to be a friend of the working man. He, he authored some minor pro-labor legislation. He actually was at least considered a pretty good employer in his ironworks. Uh, so he, would, he had an ability at least to claim that he was a, a pro-labor candidate. Uh, and then there's this guy that people are just starting to learn about, a man named Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who had left New York when his wife and mother died, tragically, uh, went out and did, did his ranching thing, and he had just come back to the city and was looking to get back into politics. And the Republican Party grabbed him and made him uh, their candidate. Uh, now, you remember that uh, image of the knight on the horse with the lance pointed at the working man, and it said subsidized press? The press is 100% on the side, as you can imagine, uh, or at least 100% against Henry George. And here you see a vivid image from Puck, right? Puck, Puck is capable of publishing pro-labor cartoons and anti-labor cartoons week after week. It's a very interesting thing. But notice this is not necessarily anti-labor, right? So here you have the devil standing behind a, um, a worker and saying, don't be fooled. George has got snake oil. He's, he's got uh, these, these great ideas about, and he's got his cornucopia in the background there, dumping it out, his free land, uh, money, you know, that he's, he's, he's going to give these things away. And so the, the way that the powers that be in the, the late 19th century tried to um, derail George, they couldn't say workers are stupid, right, because they, they need the workers' vote. They need to say, workers, you're being deluded. Don't be fooled by this, uh, you know, this, this, devil, this wolf in sheep's clothing. And there's a lot of this kind of uh, imagery. Here's an image of the Statue of Liberty, um, which was unveiled that, that fall. The Statue of Liberty is unveiled in late October of 86, and the election of 86 takes place a couple days later. So it's a very new symbol. Our Statue of Liberty, she can stand in. If you can't really tell, but the, around the Statue of Liberty are com, you know, forces of communism, forces of socialism, forces of, of uh, uh, anarchism, and forces of, as you can see in the, uh, uh, in the, in the blow up there, forces of Georgism. Right? They're lumping him in there with all this, what they see, they're kind of tarring him with that idea that he's right up there with the anarchists uh, and the violent insurrectionists. Here's another uh, tactic they use that George is going to mobilize the, the, the tramp vote, the poor, and that will have social chaos. Uh, and so a tramp here is barging into a middle class family's house to take food, you know, and it, they're blaming this on Henry George, saying, you know, the tramp's idea of the Henry George millennium, no more waiting outside for cold victuals, right? They're just going to barge on in. We'll have, social, we'll have anarchy uh, in, our, in our society if guys like George uh, are put in power. And here's another cartoon uh, showing Abram Hewitt. This is clearly the Hewitt uh, cartoon. He's the, he's the locomotive, and Teddy Roosevelt sort of hanging on there uh, with his lasso, and they're about to run over Henry George. But notice the title of his book. It's not Progress in Poverty. Uh, it's How to Prevent uh, Progress by Henry George. So there's a big media mobilization against him, ca consistently characterizing George as either a you know, airheaded dreamer or, and more and more as the election approached, a uh, agent uh, who, uh, of insurrection, of anarchy, and if he's elected, blood will flow in the streets of New York and all across the country. Um, it sounds wild, but this is really, this, is, this was what mainline candidates like uh, Abram Hewitt were saying. So George uh, has a lot to contend with, as do his supporters, and they, they do what's never been done before. They stage an incredible grassroots campaign. Hewitt doesn't even campaign. He goes to like five dinners and gives five of friends of, you know, the Chamber of Commerce types and gives five little, little speeches, most of which denounce Henry George as a red-handed communist. Uh, George is out five, every night giving five, seven, eight, ten speeches 
uh, in front of factories, in front of uh, streetcar stops, and so forth. And it's called the tailboard campaign. It's never been done before, and it's a real grassroots mobilization uh, because they've got nothing to lose. And they realize that they, if they can get people to vote, they, they might actually, uh, if, if not win the election, make it make a difference. And lo and behold, instead of 329 votes or 400 votes, George gets 68,000 votes. Um, it's a close finish, but, and it's a three-way race, so we'll never know if George had run with, uh, straight up against Hewitt, how that might have turned out. But George outpolled the Republican, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a big question about whether George lost the election because of Tammany Hall's, you know, uh, ballot box uh, shenanigans. There's a lot of allegations that, you know, the, the Tammany stole ballots, that they, uh, f you know, stuffed ballot boxes. The fact is we're never going to know. We know that, uh, as I say in the book, we know that Tammany absolutely positively could have done it, that they had done it in the past, so they were really good at it, but we just don't know if, if that, in fact, uh, happened. Uh, but it certainly makes a big impression. Of all the Labour Party candidates across the country, George is the one that people are watching. It's the one that, uh, you know, uh, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx are watching it and writing letters back and forth saying, what's going on? Who's this guy George? They don't really agree with him, but he certainly seems to be mobile, you know, pushing forward our, uh, our agenda for, for the overthrow of capitalism. And here's a great cartoon in the, in the wake of uh, George's uh, defeat, but a, but a pretty impressive defeat, and he's looking uh, pretty mighty there. And the quotation is basically saying, we, we nearly won against a splintered opposition. They're going to be united against us, so we better have a, a, a bigger hammer. And there's a real optimism coming out of this election among George supporters, among the labor movement, uh, not only locally but nationally, that this is something's happening here. This, we could easily see a third party go national in a couple of years and run, you know, a, like a, in Europe, a true third party that would be an alternative to the mainstream parties that are in the hands of, of, of big business. And here's George uh, on the eve of his, this is a, his concession speech, and he basically says, the future is ours. Uh, this was Bunker Hill, right? Bunker Hill, the, the Continentals were driven back, but they symbolically won a victory that resounded around the world. They, uh, they, made a, they won a victory that made this republic a reality, and thank God, men of New York, we in this fight have won a victory that makes the true republic of the future certain, certain in our time. There was a time when I, was, I wanted to name the book, you know, The True Republic of the Future, because I think it's a, it's a recognition that George is saying, you know, uh, you have to adjust things, right? Republics aren't just born in the 1780s and they're done, right? It's an evolution and we need to get back on track uh, to adjust to this modern world of in industry and, and so forth and technology. And if we do it, we can have a republic that will endure into the future. Uh, you can see that the attitude of the, the, the powers that be, the Republican and Democratic parties were very, very terrified by, the, by this, this result. And uh, again, couldn't denounce workers for voting for George in such huge numbers. So you see the same kind of patronizing uh, tone here. Nice job, very impressive, um, but you've got to get rid of that friend of yours. And of course, the friend is that classic symbol of anarchy uh, in the background, meaning Henry George, socialism, anarchism, communism, you need to come back to the mainstream. And in fact, the mainstream parties do make big adjustments in the wake of the George election. Uh, they they begin, begin to author pro-labor legislation and, and many other things that are aimed at uh, bringing the working class back into the Democratic Party, a little bit in the Republican Party, mostly into the, into the Democratic Party. So what's the legacy of Henry George? Uh, at the moment of the election, everybody's thinking this is just the first step. This is going to be a big thing, not just for us, but also for George. There are many people saying George is going to be president of the United States in a couple of years. Uh, it just seems that that's the way in which the world is, is moving. Uh, the next year in 1887, the, the United Labor Party decides to contest elections, um, and it just falls apart. And George breaks with them. There's a tremendous internal schism, um, fights with socialists, fights with uh, the workers, and so forth. And it's a, something I detail in the, one of the latter chapters of the book and try to explain why George seems to have changed his mind about being allied with the labor movement uh, so closely as he was in 1886 and in the years before that. And a lot of it, I think, it has to do with that kind of red, red scare uh, tactics. He read the, the writing on the wall was clear that if, any, if you want to have any influence in this country after Haymarket, after the great upheaval, you cannot be t associated with socialism, communism, anarchism. And I think he basically kind of gives the labor movement the Heisman, you know, and says, I, I, sorry, but I can't be associated with this anymore. And it's tragic because it ends his public, his, his ascent essentially uh, 
on that track uh, certainly go, is, is over. He be, continues to be influential, he continues to write books, and of course his books are still in print uh, to this day. But that aspect of George is leading an insurgent social movement, uh, that, that is over. But uh, George's influence is remarkable. Um, he sort of fades from the scene, but the number of people uh, and I, de I, I list this all at the back of the book, literally dozens of first of people who you know very well, Lincoln Steffens and um, Jacob Reese and Jane Addams, and it's just a who's who list of progressive era reformers say in their memoirs, in letters to their friends, you know what really turned my, what opened my eyes? Somebody gave me a copy of Progress in Poverty. It's an incredible number of people who found this book to be a great eye-opener and it really set them on their path in the next generation, the generation that we call uh, the Progressive Era. So that's in, in some ways some of the biggest aspects of George's uh, legacy and why he's worth knowing. Um, I should also point out that uh, most people don't know this, but the game Monopoly uh, comes from Henry George, not him directly, but one of his followers worked up a game which she called the landlord's game to demonstrate how easy it is and how pernicious it is to, for, for people to, to monopolize resources and then to squeeze everybody out and put everybody out of business and to make a long story short the game kicked around for a while and then in the 1930s a guy essentially took the game changed some of the words and changed the name sold it to Parker Brothers so it is a bit of an irony there uh, that uh, he sells it, sells it to big business and Parker Brothers then makes Monopoly the most famous board game uh, in the world and there's a new book that just a great book that just came out that details that story um, so the, but it all goes, very few people know that it actually, and, and in fact, if you remember in the 70s, there was an anti-monopoly uh, game that came out, the, which is kind of funny because the original game was essentially anti-monopoly. So what else about Henry George? Well, Henry George, why is he important then and why is he important now? For one, Henry George explains in vivid, clear, understandable, in many ways, certainly to his, his, his supporters, irrefutable evidence that extreme inequality threatens democracy and uh, we're always we, as Americans we love our there's certain things we love terms and ideas we love what are our, what are our great Republican ideals freedom individualism justice equality but we're always a little leery about equality it's the one that makes us the most nervous uh, we like the idea but we don't necessarily like the way the, some of the things that it that it tends to uh, uh, suggest uh, but George says look extreme inequality will destroy democracy and we need to find ways to limit extreme inequality in order to preserve our democracy. It's that simple. And it's an irreversible loss. If we, if we lose our democracy, it's not going to come back. A second key point, and of course that has tremendous relevance today, right? We've, in the wake of Citizens United and many other, you know, the fact that you really need to be a multi, multi-millionaire, if not a billionaire, to run for president now, uh, or for Congress for that matter, uh, is a real significant problem. Uh, the second point, though, about the common good. Uh, George essentially reminds us, and we live in an age of, you know, suddenly Ayn Rand is on the best seller list again, and more and more Americans are calling themselves libertarians than, than certainly I can remember, um, as though libertarianism, individualism is the American way. And the fact is, it is part of the American way going way, way back. There's no question that individualism is, is really car central to our political culture and our political identity, but so too is the common good. The idea that we're all in this together and that we need to adopt laws and act, enact policies and do things that attend to the common good. And you can be selfish about it, right? You can say, as people did in the 1830s, right? There's nothing in the Constitution about education. But in the 1830s, we began as a, as a country to say, you know, Public education is both a good thing to do for people that, you know, to provide people with rudimentary education and all, and it's also a really smart thing to do because we'll have less murderers and less, you know, social turmoil and so forth. And so George is, is reminding, you know, people in the Gilded Age that individualism is not the only ideal, that it has always existed side by side, in tension with, in conflict with, but always there with individualism is the common good. And we need to remember that. And I think that's a really powerful idea that needs to come back into our national conversations uh, about everything, right? About healthcare, about education, about the environment, uh, because we, we get caught up in these other, these other ideas of, of, uh, uh, of ideo ideological extremes, and we forget that some of these core principles are right there in front of us, and one of them being the common good. Uh, and then thirdly, the idea that the government, dare I say, uh, the government that everybody seems to, uh, to, to despise, but you know, as soon as you try to take away the government from people, people, you know, get very upset. They, li they like driving on roads 
They like having stoplights uh, to control traffic. They like having public schools. They like having um, police officers and so forth, keeping, uh, keeping public order. But the fact is that the idea that the government, and not simply the free market, is part of the solution is an idea that Henry George plays a key role in, in convincing large numbers of Americans that this is in fact the case, that laissez-faire made total sense in 1800. It made total sense in a land of farmers and small shops. It made sense. It no longer makes sense. And if the founding fathers were alive, they'd agree. In fact, he starts his book by saying, imagine time, ben, if we could bring Benjamin Franklin into the late 1870s, and what would he think, right? He'd be amazed by the technology, but he'd be aghast at the kind of poverty that was there, and he would be in favor of some kind of radical solution. Uh, and he says, you know, re, so, strong societies make adjustments. They need to make adjustments. And one of those adjustments is to, as the people, to empower the government to do certain things, to enact certain policies in the name of the common good, in the name of democracy. And that's really, in, in some ways, I think those three things are really the key to understanding why George mattered in the late 19th century at a fragile moment in the nation's history and why George uh, matters now. So thank you very much. And we do have time for, uh, for questions. Uh, this uh, uh, evening is being filmed by C-SPAN, and so they've asked that anybody asking questions uh, so that this could be part of the program would come down to the, podi down to the microphones at the, at the end of the walkway here. So uh, please, anybody has um, any questions, please, please jump, jump right up. I'd love to hear them. Thank you. That was a really good talk. Thanks. Um, what did Henry George have to say, if anything, about immigration? Because immigration was a very big issue at this time as well. So right. I mean, the, the parallels with Gilded Age don't, are not just about the economy and, uh, and poverty and, and corporations, right? It's an era of tremendous wrangling about immigration. It's also an era in which there's a big movement to deprive poor people of the vote. I mean, there's a lot of parallels there. So George um, is a little bit complicated uh, when it comes to immigration. He, his early days as a reformer and as a writer in California, uh, he wrote some pretty blistering racist things about Chinese immigration. But that was, as anybody would tell you, that was sort of mainstream thinking at the time, not to let him off the hook, but to say that um, progressive, I think it was, uh, I can't think of the historian, but he, uh, Michael Kazin, I think, wrote that progressivism stopped with the Chinese, right? You could be uh, progressive and open-minded about everything, but you could, you could draw the line saying, that, but the Chinese are accepted. So early on, he was pretty harsh about Chinese immigration, not immigration in general. Um, he, he, he gradually moved away from that quite explicitly uh, by the time he wrote Progress and Poverty. Um, he said immigration is a good thing, but immigration in some ways is a reflection of the problem of monopoly and the problem of inequality. Uh, so that in some ways we need to address that both here um, and abroad. But he was a very tolerant person as far as, uh, as, far as immigration goes. Um, he mostly saw if he wrote anything critical about immigration, it was mostly the fact that people were being forced to migrate, as opposed to it being a, a necessarily a social problem for the United States. Yep. Um, um, uh, there's a two-part question. The first is, could you explain uh, uh, George's point about taxing land and, and that uh, central economic principle? Yep. The second is that Francis Fukuyama's book, uh, Political Order and Political Decay, um, he argues that uh, an American government is so decentralized uh, that it, uh, it, it, it works against progress of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Henry George seemed to think that there was a moral principle at work here, but uh, structurally, our, 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 um, our, our political system, from its decentralization to uh, the wealthy having a significant edge in the way the Constitution was designed, um, it makes uh, reform, uh, a long-standing reform, almost impossible. Yeah, I, I, um, so let's take the first question. Um, <laughs> I, always, I usually preface my, conver my conversations with people by saying, and by the way, I'm a historian, not an economist, so I uh, have a little bit of trouble trying to explain George's uh, uh, economic theory. And George himself never really got too much into the details. Um, he sort of said, look, it, it, to him it made perfect sense. It didn't need a great explanation. But basically he said, you know, land, um, especially land, uh, it derives its value not because it's in and of itself valuable, but because of socially created wealth. Uh, 
that if you own a piece of land, we see this all around us in New York City, why is one, I was just down on Wall Street uh, this morning, you know, and there's a, it's a 45, 55 Broad Street, it's this empty hole in the ground, and I literally said to the person I was walking with, I wonder how, I've always wondered how much that piece of land is worth. I mean, it's, dirt wise, it's just as valuable as, you know, uh, some place in the middle of North Dakota but it's socially created wealth. It's probably worth a billion dollars. And so George says that wealth is generated by us, not by the person who owns the land who's lucky enough to have acquired it or schemed to get it. It's us. It's our energy. It's our creativity. It's our, what we put into the market, what we take out of the market, and therefore that value needs to be taxed for the common good. And that was his, his essential principle. And he said, look, if, it, if, it's a, you know, if a piece of property is worth $500, you can use it as though it's private property, but you owe, at the end of the year, $500. And if you don't want to pay it, fine, walk away. The, that, that farm, that workshop will be uh, sold or, or, you know, again, he doesn't even say sell, sort of uh, um, hand it over to another person who's willing to work it and pay that, uh, pay that fee. So, again, more, more, it's more the, the broad ideas that he's talking about here than the specifics of that reform that, that really mattered to most people. Um, and then, the, the, so that's question one. Number two, the, 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 our political system. We have a wonderful political system, but um, the question got to, got to a really important point. have a system very different from uh, much of Western Europe. And so one of the great eternal questions in American history is why don't we, unlike, you know, why are we so different from other industrialized societies where everywhere you look there's a socialist party, a labor party, and they're powerful, and they win elections. Why not in America? There's all kinds of examples, uh, explanations given about our political culture and our history and so forth. But one of them is it's just impossible to form a third party uh, and to do these things because we have this federal system and it's, uh, it's winner take all, um, unlike a parliamentary system. So, you know, if you look at the history of Europe and, and other countries where a labor party gets going, you know, they usually win three seats in parliament, right? So they have almost no power, but they get that toehold and then they get seven seats and then they get nine seats and then there's a big, you know, uh, throw the bums out election and suddenly they are a coalition, part of a coalition. And that just simply doesn't happen in the United States. So our, our as, and there are virtues to our system too, right? States can work as laboratories of experiment. You know, they used to say that about Wisconsin in the progressive era, where new ideas can be tried and then go national. But I think in terms of a real long-standing structural change, it does make it very, very difficult. Oh, for yeah. Christ's sake. Oh, sorry, that's right. I, was, I should be alternating. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm addressing uh, some of your uh, discussion with uh, some kind of long-term study of Henry George, which I do not think you addressed adequately. I think your pictures and your uh, <laughs> history were lovely, but in fact, you did not address the science of political economy, which is probably the best book on political economy anybody has ever written. And uh, it, it, its analysis of land, labor, and capital, and the returns to them of mm -hmm. wage, of uh, rent, wage, economic rent, uh, wages, and, and interest are uh, uh, really uh, groundbreaking and have not been duplicated. And it is that, I think, that ha because it requires some study that is always elided and everybody jumps on single tax and popular populism and not the, the basic material that makes Henry George important. And I think maybe a re-emphasis on that would be desirable. All right, well, I, I think uh, I'll take your point that um, I didn't talk much about his second book, um, The Science of Political Economy, or actually it's his third book. Um, I do talk about it in my book uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that he has the, the nightmare that all writers fear. He writes the book, of course, longhand, uh, moves to Brooklyn, and he can't find it when he gets there. Loses the whole manuscript. So he has to literally take his pen out and rewrite from notes and memory the entire book. So... It's a, one of those things that, it, like I said, in our day we'd be worried about a, you know, a file disappearing in our, on our, from our hard drive or something. But, um, but the reason I don't talk too much about that particular book is that the focus of my uh, work on Henry George is that period where he's up to about 1887, where he's this, a key figure. The book, Science of Political Economy comes out um, in 1886 um, and begins to um, make a, you know, be part of the, the important George canon. But it's not the... 
It's not the one that, that mo creates his momentum, creates his national and eventually international uh, profile. And one thing we see with George is he he's, uh, has a lot to say about a lot of different things. And one of them is he says political economy, what we would call economics today, political economy has lost its way, right? It's in the service of power. And it should be in the service of humanity. And so he's got a lot to say about that in that book and in other writings, uh, which accounts for the fact that even though he, he criticized the academy, he secretly sort of hoped to become a professor or, or at least have that kind of cred credibility on some level. Um, and he was never going to get it because he was so, uh, so critical of them. Yeah, um, a lot of the people who Henry George influenced seem to have ultimately very different critiques of capitalism and understandings mm. of inequality. And when you look at the welfare state in the 20th century, their justifications, social citizenship for the masses or positive liberty for individuals. But the actual understanding of inequality and the source of it that Henry George develops, I'm, I'm not sure how much that survived, or at least from, from what I understand. So I'm yeah. curious about whether you, how his ideas about inequality and its sources maybe influenced reformers in terms of trying to set up specific policies yeah. and what maybe his attitudes towards welfare, the welfare state more generally might Yeah, be. I mean, he always said he was in favor of a small state, even though you know, he, he sort of spoke both ways. But I would say there are a couple things that George did, again, not specifically, but that broad ideas that he, uh, one we talked about, which is that the state needs to be an instrument of reform. You just have to, you have to do that. And the other one is emphasizing, he's not, again, not the only one, but he's really the first one, and he's the first one to do it on a big stage, is to say citizenship in a republic is not confined to election day. That's, you know, we always thought, well, we're all equal, right? I'm equal, we're, we're equal because we have, each of us has one vote. And George says, that's great, that's an important thing, but the longer we develop as a society, we are coming to realize that there is an economic dimension, a material dimension to citizenship. And that without it, your vote is useless. It's worthless. If you're starving, if you're living in a you know, hand to mouth and unable to feed your family, your vote is worthless. And so that's a concept that, the, that I think really influences broadly, not specifically, but broadly, um, a lot of reformers in the, in the progressive era and then afterward. And then just think about it. In fact, I've got a whole collection of FDR quotes that, that are literally sound like he, he's quoting progress and poverty. And when FDR comes out in 1941 with the four freedoms, articulating, sort of specifying what are core freedoms in that, in that tumultuous period. One of them is freedom from want. And that was controversial. People said, how socialist can you get? But his point was, if you don't, he says exactly the same thing. If, pe if you do not, people that don't have basic material needs met are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. And of course, he's saying that in the 30s and early 40s when we know what dictatorships are all about. So I would say those two things, that the state is an important instrument of reform and that citizenship in a modern republic has a material and economic dimension that you can't ignore. Yeah. Uh, regarding Georgia's contemporary relevance, mm -hmm. uh, there is an argument out there that in fact, there isn't much we can do in the current era about economic inequality due to globalization of trade. Mm. That therefore, and in fact, neither party really has a practical program that would reduce economic inequality. Therefore, we should give up on reducing economic inequality and focus on social inequality and try to build strong public institutions, schools, parks, mm -hmm. healthcare institutions that everyone can, can share but not focus so much on economic inequality because we can't really do anything about it. What do you think George would say about that? And what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And I think that uh, I know exactly what George would say, which is that um, my, my reform scheme, uh, the single tax will bring those two things, uh, you'll get both. Um, and this was, with, with George, the last part of his book, he's very utopian. He's basically saying, you know, the, the, the true republic of the future, he's essentially saying, and he says explicitly in, in his writings, we're basically going to have a socialist society. We're not going to have a revolutionary socialist society where the masses rise up and slit the throats of the landowners and, and seize everything in the name of the people, but we will, he, and he, he sketches this out. He says, you know, in, in the near future, we will have a, a society where everybody has full employment and they won't have to work that hard. There'll be beautiful parts. There'll be fabulous uh, libraries. There'll be, you know, uh, forums for learning, and, and it'll just be this ideal society. So he thought you could have both: uh, a reduced 
not eliminated, but reduced economic inequality and uh, the kind of social institutions that, that would benefit, benefit everybody. So he was a, a dreamer in that regard. And what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I have to say, it's, I, I think he's, in some ways that's a very utopian uh, vision, but I do believe, uh, getting back to the, the, the points that I put up there at the end, which is that um, we do need to keep, as a society, as we have many times in the past, as the Founding Fathers did many times in the past, uh, they have to think about the common good and think about what it is that we, what do we really care about? And uh, do we, what are the really fundamental problems here? And who's really to blame? You know, there's a lot of, we're in a kind of a demagogic uh, moment where all kinds of people, you know, immigrants and, and uh, uh, people on welfare and such are being blamed when uh, there are other people that could be uh, pointed to. And, we've, and it's social policy. You know, we are, uh, we have, where do these inequality statistics come from? Where does this problem come from? It's traceable to various moments in our political history starting in the late 1970s. Uh, you can see what, we, what ta the tax rate was in uh, 1955 when we were, had enjoyed incredible prosperity and, in, and a very you know, reduced uh, level of inequality. And you can see what it is in 1980 and 1990 and 19, you know, in 2000. Um, it's had a direct bearing on, on where we are. And then also this political culture of demonizing the government as though, as though it's this you know, horrible institution. I don't like the, you know, paying taxes is painful, um, but it is the stuff, you know, the price we pay for life on this earth and in this society. And so I don't know how we change that, that conversation. It seems almost Im impossible, but I think that kind of conversation uh, is, I wouldn't want to be too dramatic and say that we, it'll, it's the difference between success and failure, but I think it's part, if we're going to pull ourselves, put ourselves back on a more, um, uh, prosperous and generous and successful uh, track as a republic, um, then that's, that's really what has to take place. It's not going to happen if we, don't, if we just continue to argue about uh, who's to blame and, and, um, and do nothing, essentially, or, or do only the wrong things. So, yeah. Uh, my question is regards to what was Henry George's view of imperialism and uh, empire building? Ah, it's a good question. Let me just think on that one for a second. Um, I mean, I think he, he, one of the places where he started to get attention was when he joined the Irish nationalist movement. And of course, Ireland was not an independent country at the time. They're trying to gain their independence, but they're, co they're colonized society. So in, in many ways, he has very harsh things to say about uh, colonization, you know, colonialism and imperialism, because he sees it, you know, as this naked, you know, illegitimate land grab, resource grab by the powerful, sort of the haves and have-nots on, on a global scale. Um, but he, you know, historically, he, he talks rather glowingly about the heyday of the, of the Roman Republic and, and of imperialism uh, of that order. So I don't know, it probably is, probably are um, passages in some of his writings, not so much Progress and Poverty, if I remember correctly, but Social Problems, which is his collection of essays. But I don't know. I think he, um, let's put it this way, I think he saw the world's a host of other problems, like inequality, like um, uh, the, the social turmoil, strikes, and, and things of that nature, as far more dangerous uh, and immoral than, than imperialism. And I think part of that, and again, I'm thinking my way through this answer in, right in front of you, but I think part of it is that um, his time period of the 1870s, 1880s, the United States is acquiring Alaska, it's acquiring, you know, it's getting into the imperialist game, but in a very, very small way, and it's really not until the Spanish-American War that we really go, go all in in that regard. So maybe that accounts for some of the reasons why he wouldn't have, he might have talked about it in more abstract terms, but certainly didn't talk about it in, in U.S. terms. I'm going to alternate. Yep. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I see parallels between what you've spoken about and our current time. And I happen to be wearing a, a Bernie Sanders t-shirt. So my question is... <laughs> Bernie Sanders is uh, certainly in the news. Yeah, what do you think about not the media, but the computer, the, the conversation that we're having? Uh, and and his progress through, through to the to the common people. I mean, in terms of Bernie Sanders' moment that's happening now, as the Democratic candidate and then the future president of the United States. Well, we might, you know, uh, 
It's an interesting question, and um, I don't know how to answer it. I mean, I think Bernie Sanders is a very healthy, his addition to the electorate is very healthy for our, because he's, he's bringing up and forcing conversations on things like inequality uh, that people are much rather talk about undocumented immigrants um, and in crazy terms than talking about uh, inequality. Um, but I don't know, and, and Bernie Sanders certainly fits into a long tradition of this kind of populist tradition that does help move the conversation uh, in particular directions. I don't know if Bernie Sanders will ever get uh, uh, nominated or elected, but another interesting thing about it is he has the, he has the bra he's brave enough to call himself openly a democratic socialist. And it does show in some ways the poverty of our political imagination that, we, that that's sort of a deal breaker for people without even understanding what that, what that actually means. Um, Americans have long, way before Henry George, have you know, decided that socialism is an unadulterated evil and that it's un-American. And yet, throughout our history, we have embraced many aspects of socialism that we would not want to live, uh, not want to live without. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm in following Bernie Sanders with great interest. I will put it that way. Yeah, near the beginning, you made the comment about history not repeating, but perhaps rhyming. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. I mean, most of your conclusions were about similarities between this period and the Gilded Age. Could you talk a little bit about perhaps what you see as differences between the Gilded Age and this period? Well, let's see. Um, horses. <laughs> uh, um, lots of things. Um, I'm just thinking of, you know, the... Um, what it was like to live in New York in the 1870s and 1880s. I mean, they are very different eras. And there are some things that are just utterly and completely different. Um, technology, I mean, just the way we communicate, the, the, the way our politics and our the way we, we, our recreation, our politics and everything is so fundamentally different from uh, what was taking place in the 19th century. In the 19th century, late 19th century, the Gilded Age, if you wanted to communicate, you published something in a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, or you gave a public lecture. And that was really it. Uh, whereas now, it, it's so fragmented. I mean, I don't even know how to, to me, I would say, you know, I'm born in 1963, so I remember typewriters and rotary phones, and I'm just, I'm sort of got one foot firmly planted in that world, yet I'm, uh, you know, I have an iPhone and I use social media and I, you know, use computer technology all the time. So I would say that um, that is one of the great differences. Uh, and what it means, I don't know, but it is one of the great differences. Some people look at that and say that's where the, rev that's where the great reform is going to take place. This kind of grassroots reform, uh, reform movement that, that can be done through you know, people's iPhones and social media. We can, we, we, this is how we're going to get people to the polls. That's how we're going to be able to, to shake things up to get politics out of the clutches of uh, the hands of big business. Um, I don't know. On the other hand, people say, the other way to looking at it is that people are just too busy looking at their screens and watching, um, you know, playing games and, and sh cat videos that they're not, they're not paying attention. They're upset, they're angry, but they're not paying attention. So I would say that that's probably the biggest difference. I mean, there clearly are lots of our economies quite different. Our position in the world is different. Um, our military um, is, you know, up until I was, students are always fascinated to, to learn this. I say, you know, up, one of the things the Constitution and the founders that were absolutely agreeing is that no military. You just have bare bones military. A couple thousand people, that's it. Um, because if you had a, a standing army, a military, that's how tyranny occurs and that's how democracies are done in. That's what history tells us. And that was our, you know, we had five ways to, five ways to go to war as a society in the United States. Five steps. First, declare war. Second step is say, oh my gosh, we don't have a military. Third step, build a military. Fourth step, win the war. Fifth step, dismantle the military until the next war comes along. And it's only after World War II, which we dismantled our military and then immediately built it back up in 19, starting in 1950 uh, with the Cold War. So that's another thing that when you look at where our resources go and, 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 and uh, in, in, in how, we, how we talk about that, that's another massive difference between uh, then and now. Um, in his writings on inequality during the Gilded Age, did George discuss the end of Reconstruction and the disenfranchisement of African Americans? Uh, yes, he did. Um, George didn't have a lot to say about racial equality, although he pretty much, he, he spoke in sort of racial equality terms. But when he talked about Reconstruction, he basically talked about it in only one way, which was, you want to see the, the evidence why land is so important? Right? Giving people freedom, back to this question, point earlier, citizenship requires material well-being. It requires, there's, a, there's an economic dimension to it. So when enslaved people are granted their freedom uh, and no land, 
guess what happens? The old, you know, the, the, they're going to be put into a, not slavery again, but something darn close to it, complete subordination, complete powerlessness for a long, long time. And so that's what he spoke of. He said, you, we have a textbook example right under our nose uh, about this, this very thing. So that was the, the, the primary thing that he, that he spoke about. Did, um, did uh, Henry George, in, I, in any of his books, address the role of warfare or war in the political economy of the United States? Well, I think that's a good question. I need to think on that a little bit. Um, I mean, I think George, if I recall, this, he talks about warfare as being, you know, one of the options of an of a, of a unfree or a... Uh, an undemocratic government, right? They would, what do governments do when to avoid dealing with social problems? They, they, de they declare war. But, and there are a few, probably a few other places where he talks about warfare. Um, but I think I just in some ways anticipated that because saying that, you know, in 1879 when he writes, the, uh, writes his book, uh, Progress and Poverty, the American military is tiny. And the only place that it's big is out, out in the West completing the suppression of Native Americans. And even then it's, not very many people, you know, relatively speaking. So I think um, the military did not loom very large in people's minds uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. It will start to, right around 1880 is when we start to expand our Navy. And in, uh, you know, we start to getting, certainly Navy-wise, Navy to start to build up our military in that regard as part of our notion of ourselves emerging as a, as a global power. But I think the military, I would say George would argued, as did most people in that time period, that the real sources of power that we have to be worried about are these large uh, business tycoons, these large corporations. Because these are, this is not just power, it's unelected, untouchable power, unless we do something about it, unless we decide that we, that we in the name of the common good, in the name of, of democracy, that we need to rein some of this power in. Not eliminate it, not seize control of, of corporations, but find ways to set up some boundaries, some parameters for their behavior. All right. Thank you very much, folks. <laughs>